for a hearing on the cost of treating autism, looking at the government's response to the increasing incidence of the disease. The committee is chaired by Congressman Darrell Issa, Ranking Member Congressman Elijah Cummings. It's just starting. Government reform will come to order. This hearing on one in 88 children, a look into the federal response to rising rates, will come to order. The Oversight Committee exists to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn obligation is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the federal bureaucracy. This is our mission, and I might say today, in many cases, we're dealing with people who, because of this affliction, may never pay taxes, but in fact, their families and others pay for an entire life. Congress spends a lot of time discussing and debating issues and determining by our <clears throat> philosophical beliefs what the role of government should be. As we have seen in these debates surrounding TARP, stimulus, health care reform, these kinds of issues oftentimes come down to where you fall on an ideological spectrum. Today is no such thing. We're having a hearing focused on something that spans the ideological left to the ideological right. We're drawing attention to something that has no political affiliation, no partisan allegiance, and sometimes, and we believe today, not nearly enough focus on something that does not shorten life, but dramatically, or even slightly, but usually more than slightly, reduces the quality of life, both for the individual and for their families. I'm a father, as far as I know, I'm one of the fortunate ones. I'm not the one in 88. But right now, if the, if the numbers are accurate and if they continue to grow from the now one in 88 that in some way are ASD affected, we in fact have an epidemic. It could be that some of the one in 150 of a century at the start of the previous century was too low, that in fact people were simply not diagnosed. But few people believe that in fact there aren't factors in our society and our behavior in the air we breathe, the water we consume, or others that are affecting how many people will be afflicted. We're going to hear from a distinguished panel first of people who do this for a living, try to get to the causes, prevention, I won't say cure today, but at least the treatment, the understanding and perhaps, in some cases, truly something that would mitigate their suffering. I know they're frustrated. Congress, although we put nearly a quarter of a billion dollars a year directly into research, has not put the kind of dollars, perhaps, that could bring specific outcomes sooner. On our second panel, a number of individuals will say that, in fact, one of the problems is we're looking on one side of the equation and not nearly enough on what to do for the victims of various parts of autism. The fact is, they're all right. There is not enough money being placed on the various possible causes of autism. There is not enough study. Our government does not collect statistics as well as perhaps someday soon we will, so that in fact we can find out what the true number is, cross-check every aspect of how that number which is a human being, came to be afflicted. The, the, the truth is, we have a lot to do. I will not claim that I have come here timely. This is the last few days of my first two years as chairman, and this is our first hearing. What I will promise you here today is that we will stay involved in this issue. We will stay involved through staff and through, if appropriate, additional hearings. I also would say to our first distinguished panel that one of the most important priorities I place today is, in fact, that we work with you and help you in this process, that we be a conduit to the rest of Congress 
on this important issue. In a few moments, I'll be swearing in, I'm sorry, I'll be recognizing by unanimous consent a number of members who would not ordinarily be here at a hearing because they are involved in this issue but serve on other committees. Additionally, I want to apologize to all of those people who rightfully so would be well to be heard here today. I could have had a second panel of at least 20 witnesses from organizations and from affected individuals. We had the difficult job of selecting just six, and as the ranking member will, will undoubtedly agree, six is already a fairly large single panel. That is one of the reasons I pledge to you today that any organization or individual that in the next seven days provides to us, as required by our rules, in electronic format, or if you give it to us in paper, we will try to scan it, we will include your statements and your information in the record. We will hold the record open so that the many who could not be heard live in testimony will, in fact, be at least in the record. I want to particularly recognize Brian Hooker with uh, Focus Autism, the American Academy of Children and uh, no, actually it's a long, long title. I'm uh, sorry, who in fact has been one of the people who has championed for today's hearing, and a number of others. They've been essential in my getting a better understanding. I also would like to thank, and we will be recognizing two witnesses or two members on each side. Um, the former chairman of the full committee, Dan Burton, who years ago began a process of, of focusing on some aspects of this terrible uh, disease. We, in fact, don't know enough. Our goal is to know more. Today is but a down payment on that. And with that, I'd like to thank the ranking member for his assistance in putting together today's hearing and recognize him for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I do thank you for holding today's uh, hearing. Um, before I, I get started, I want to pay special note, as you all you have already done, um, to our friend who is leaving, uh, Mr. Burton. Uh, over my 17 years on this committee, this has been an issue that he has constantly put forth uh, and constantly made sure that we tried to address as best we could. And so, Mr. Burton, I want to thank you for your vigilance. And I want you to know that although you may be leaving the Congress, uh, as the Chairman has said, we will continue to fight. And I know you will, too. Um, Mr. Chairman, we have learned much about the autism spectrum disorders uh, over the past decade. Taxpayer-sponsored research has identified risk factors and evaluated therapies to assist with some symptoms. Physicians and parents now have a better understanding of the developmental signs and the symptoms allowing for earlier detection. And educators have experience with new methods and approaches for assisting children with autism. Congress has also acted to help individuals with autism and their families in significant ways. In 2010, we passed the Affordable Care Act, which contains significant new protections. Insurers may no longer discriminate against individuals based on pre-existing conditions. Insurers may no longer impose lifetime caps on health care coverage. New plans must include screening for autism without additional costs to the parents. And young people diagnosed with autism spectrum order, disorders may remain on their parents' health insurance plans until they are 26 years old. These are real and significant protections that will improve the lives of millions of American families. Even with this progress, there is still more to learn and there is still more to do. While autism affects all racial, socioeconomic, and ethnic uh, groups, some studies have shown that African American, Hispanic, and Asian children are less likely to receive an early diagnosis. These delay delayed diagnoses cause minority children to be further behind in the development of language and motor skills. We must be vigilant in emphasizing early detection and intervention for all our children, as an early diagnosis can make a critical difference in the lifelong development of a child. 
We must also continue to invest federal research dollars in new and evolving therapies to improve the lives of those with autism spectrum disorders.